Happen on WGNS. The Good Neighbor Network, FM 101.9 and AM 1450 Murfreesboro, FM 100.5 Smyrna, and online at WGNSRadio.com. This is the Roundtable, a look at the news, views, politics, and people that are shaping Rutherford County. Good morning on a kind of a drizzly morning, but this is April showers and brings the May flowers. This is Bill Krause on the WGNS uh, Roundtable for Thursday morning. And we're so delighted to have a gentleman that I just met for the first time. But in the moment I met him, I said, this is going to be a very interesting gentleman to have on the Roundtable. Dr. Francis T. I want to get it correct. That's correct. Uh, who is with Middle Tennessee State University. And uh, I'm going to actually have you introduce yourself. I want to know all about you, where you were born, where you've been, what you've done, where you got your education. Almost take the whole show and uh, then learn what you've been doing the last five years at uh, MTSU. So, born where? I am Francis Cote. I'm a professor in the Department of Global Studies and Human Geography, and I was born in Kenya, East Africa. And I studied in there. Were you in Nairobi or...? I was born east of Nairobi in okay. a city called Machakos. Mm-hmm. And I grew up in Machakos, but spent three years at the university in Nairobi, Kenyatta University in Nairobi, where I obtained a bachelor's degree in education. Mm-hmm. And Did you want to be a teacher originally? I wanted to be a teacher uh-huh. and taught at the city of Nairobi for five years before I went to graduate school. What grade level? I taught high school. And what topics? I taught geography and history. So you've been there right from the <laughs> beginning. Wow. I taught geography and history for five years and then went to graduate school here in the United States in West Virginia University. Mm-hmm. Majoring in, again in the uh, geography? Majored in geography and focused on urban and regional planning for my master's degree and my PhD research was in understanding African cities. Wow. And you're going to Africa in a week or so? I will be leaving for Tanzania. I conduct a study abroad program to Tanzania uh, and we are leaving on May 11th and we'll be, I'm traveling with a, a group of seven students mm. and we'll be there for, from May 11th through May 29th. Now, what part of Africa is Tanzania, eastern? Tanzania is in eastern Africa. Right. Yes. Uh, Next to Kenya? Next to Kenya and Uganda and border to the west by Democratic Republic of the Congo and Malawi to the south. Wow. Mm -hmm. All names that not too many people are (laughs) as familiar with. (laughs) And you came to the United States initially to go to West Virginia. Came to the United States initially to go to West Virginia where I did my master's degree and back-to-back with PhD. I imagine West Virginia was a little bit different than Kenya. Absolutely. (laughs) And they're always from geography. Well, not so much geography. Kenya is mountainous at points, isn't it? Kenya is. There are some parts which are mountainous, Mm -hmm. but I do not come from the mountainous part of Kenya. I come from the lowlands part of Kenya. Mm -hmm. So dry, uh, let's say, savanna climate to the humid continental climate of West Virginia. Gotcha, gotcha. (laughs) And once you got your uh, education out of the way, where did you go? After my PhD, I accepted a position as an assistant professor at the University of North Alabama in Florence, Alabama. Okay. And spent 15 years there from going through the ranks from assistant professor to full professor. Wow. <laughs> and wow. And then from there, you came to Murfreesboro. Spent 15 years there from 2004 to 2019 when I moved to Middle Tennessee State University. I've been there in the last five years. Great. Talk about the recent or the pending or the ongoing consolidation of your department with political science. That is a very exciting opportunity. The Department of Global Studies and Human Geography and the Department of Political Science and International Relations have gone through a merger, which -hmm. will become official starting this fall semester. And it is very exciting. And there's a lot of... uh, parallels and commonalities between the two departments. Define human geography. To me, I think of human (laughs) beings as people with legs and arms, and I think of geography with rocks and mountains (laughs) and uh, the (laughs) physical land. What's the uh, relationship, and is it the movement of people, the living of people? Now, let me 
back up a little bit and Great. talk about geography itself. Okay. Uh, so geography itself, mainly you are looking at relationships across the Earth's surface between the physical aspects of the Earth and human aspects of the Earth. Mm -hmm. Geographers use maps to understand those relationships across space. And maps have gone from the traditional pen and paper to more modern geospatial technologies. Sure. But now, within those two branches of geography, which is the physical geography, the natural, how the Earth works, pretty much, mm -hmm. uh, the climates and the vegetation and landscapes, which you sure. just described, then there is a human part of geography where you're dealing with aspects whose things, whose distributional aspects are generally influenced by humans. Or are human beings locate and move to and live in areas defined by geography. You could argue that. <laughs> okay, uh, so it's a so, But you can call it cultural geography. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. But yet if uh, you have a group of people looking for a new home, and the new home has got to have the elements of water, and the elements of woods, and the elements of shelter, and the elements of uh, ability to uh, grow crop and so forth, wouldn't the geography have a direct relationship on the attraction or the non-attraction? For example, if you take a look at the changing pattern of the Sahara, and the more the Sahara may expand, what impact is that going to have on populations in Algeria or in uh, all of northern Africa? Both the human and physical geography are 100% related. Okay. And Good. there are... There are interaction. the human interactions across space are mm -hmm. very important. And say, for example, in West Virginia, people mine coal. Mm -hmm. And when we mine coal, the, the, what you get out of the coal, there is pollution of streams. Yes. Uh, and those pollution of streams impact the water that people drink. Or so the, the physical aspect has an impact on their human the human aspect. The lung disease that so many coal miners had over the years before they went into safety precautions was totally related to the fact of coal and the production. Absolutely. So physical geography and human geography are 100% related. And so geographers look at those patterns, uh, mm -hmm. special patterns, special dimensions, special connections, special interactions, and then the implications of when those interactions happen. And when you start changing the geography, I was just talking in a class last night, actually, hmm. uh, about uh, climate change and talking about the fact that we no longer refer to the Amazon basin as an area that was our greatest carbon protection with the mass area along the Amazon in Brazil because the trees and the forestation have been removed over the years for allowing land for crops and land for cattle, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, as you see deforestation or as you see change of the use of land, that's got to have an impact not only on the physical geography and the physical climate, but on how people live and how people survive. Absolutely. And when you look at climate generally, what we do impacts the environment where we live in. Mm -hmm. And whether it is on a micro scale or macro scale, things we do on a daily basis impact the climate. Well, of course, climate change has been one of the major topics politically, academically, uh, certainly an in interest. And yet, you know, I can look back in 1970, 1971, and I shall never forget this as a story that I was city manager of a small community in California, Beaumont, a very poor community, a uh, senior community, et cetera, and a uh, major oil refinery was wanting to locate in the community. And that's before anybody was really concerned about what was being spewed in the air, etc. And the refinery uh, was planning to come in there, and we were up the mountain from Palm Springs, which is a major, major tourist uh, recreational activity. They were very fearful of a refinery. Suddenly they became very concerned, politically became very active. And shortly after that, there was a massive oil spill off Santa Barbara which literally, as I would believe, has triggered off the entire environmental concerns based upon the oil spill in uh, Santa Barbara. 
Uh, President Nixon at that time established the EPA uh, in the early 1970s. But you know, one thing about getting older, as long as you have your memory, you remember things. Mm -hmm. And the greatest fear in the early 70s that we were entering another ice age. Not uh, global warming, but an ice age. And they were talking about how New York by the year 2000 would be part of it underwater because uh, the ice and the uh, water has got colder. And oh, it was a long story. And then I always was curious how the ice age became uh, global warming. It was almost like overnight, you know, Absolutely. suddenly. Now we don't use the term global warming anymore. We use the term climate change. Uh, so do you cover much of this in relationship to geography and the human element? Every aspect of the things I teach, one way or another, touches climate change. I teach three primary courses. Okay. I teach an introductory course in introduction to regional geography, mm -hmm. where we look at the physical and human aspects in the major regions of the world, whether mm -hmm. it is Europe or it's Middle and, North, uh, and South America, or North America, Russia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle mm -hmm. East and North Africa. Each region use a framework to look at each region. And within the themes that I cover, one of them focuses on climate. And the reason why that is important, it is not a secret that mm -hmm. the climate change is a real thing. Mm -hmm. And it has implications. Whether it is implications in terms of disaster risk or implications in terms of food and nutrition security or whether it is uh, in terms of water supply itself oh, absolutely. Uh, for our use or forestry and wildlife, mm -hmm. tourism, places that depend on tourism like where I come from, exactly. uh, Eastern or Africa, Middle Tennessee, <laughs> or sanitation and sure. places we live sure. or uh, or uh, in terms of manufacturing and mm -hmm. energy and transportation, each one of those things touches on climate. But you know, it's interesting, and again, I'm not a scientist, uh, a political scientist, but that doesn't count in this way, but I'm not a scientist. <laughs> but, you know, I guess I have the one question. It, we've always had climate change as long as there's been a planet. The planet has always, as it evolved, as it's changed, as the gas levels have changed, as the relationship to the sun and the moon has changed. And I had heard here some years ago after the massive earthquake in Japan when it uh, threatened the nuclear plant on the eastern side of Japan. And I remember the comment made by some Caltech scientists that every time there's an earthquake around a seven Richter scale, that the planet changes its course maybe three to four inches that the planet is ever changing it's revolving and so my old non-scientific logic is well that means the relationship of parts of the earth to the sun may become warmer may become cooler uh, every time you move an object a slight distance from the source of light you're going to have a slight change I'm I guess I raise the question how much of climate change is a natural physics phenomena and how much is climate change is contributed by the human being. So let me first of all issue a disclaimer that climate change is not my area of oh, research. I, that I, is I, not I, my I, area of research. Who would ever hear anybody talking about the world, you know, the way, but I, I, I appreciate it and I'm not certain. It, is, not it is not my area of research. It is not my area of research. Sure. But generally speaking, uh, how the atmosphere heats or warms is 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 not a huge mystery. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> if there is heating even on the table that we are we have in front of us here, if you heat it, depending on the material of the, this table here, the air above the table, due to contact to a warm surface, will rise. Mm -hmm. okay. And as it rises, it cools and condenses, and that is just a natural process happening. And things we do do contribute to the chemistry of the atmosphere. That's mm -hmm. another thing which is not a mystery. Mm -hmm. There are both natural and anthropogenic causes of 
changes in okay. the atmosphere. And since this is not my area of research, I, I'll try not to I, commit oh, myself. Oh, no, 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 no. I totally, <laughs> I, Francis, I am, <laughs> this is not part of the direction I wanted to proceed on. However, however, uh, when we go back and let's say you have a first class uh, in your initial introductory course in your department, uh, what are you alerting the students to be aware of? Why are they taking the course? What do you expect them to learn? What impact would that have on them if they're going into political science, if they're going into teaching, if they're going into corporate, if they're going into government? Uh, what do you anticipate they will be picking up, learning, absorbing in the introductory uh, courses that you're teaching? First of all, when students come to my introduction, introductory class, most of those students are straight from high school oh, or, really? in, so, okay. or in their mm -hmm. second semester at mm -hmm. the university. So one of the things I look to develop in them is the ability to communicate mm -hmm. and the ability to say things with confidence that we are learning in a class. Say, for example, the things you and I are discussing okay, now, okay. how the relationships across the Earth's surface. Mm -hmm. And say, for example, when they are talking about how what happens in one part of the Earth impacts another part of the planet. Say, mm -hmm. for example, the conflict in Western, in Western Europe. Mm -hmm. It affects food supply in East Africa. Mm -hmm. I want them to be able to think broadly on the implications okay. of things that happen across the Earth's surface. Well, certainly, uh, when you take a look at the current conflict in the Middle East and the effect on shipping yep. uh, through mm -hmm. the Suez Canal yes. and the effect of ships that are carrying petroleum having to go all around the tip of Africa yes. in order to avoid conflict, the cost of petroleum and the refined petroleum and the gasoline is going to go up at the pump. And Absolutely. So when you say, my gosh, gas has gone up 20 cents a gallon since last week. Well, then what you're saying is you track it back and you don't just say, well, it's the big mean oil refiners who want to make a bigger profit. No, you got to talk about cause and effect and linkage. Think about the big picture. And I'm hoping when students leave my classes, they have developed the, the ability to think logically. Mm -hmm. and to make connections between things. Exactly. And to develop arguments mm -hmm. and ask questions. Most ask importantly, right questions. ask the right questions. Correct. And if they can leave my class with that kind of background, I'm excited to have them exactly. in an advanced level class. And in five years, have you been tracking some of your former students? I have uh -huh. uh, some of my former students. Some are still with the, going to graduate school. Mm -hmm. Others are in a workforce, mm -hmm. and others are overseas because most of our students are global study students, right. and they tend to spend a year overseas perhaps teaching English and working in the diplomatic service, and mm -hmm. I still keep in touch with my students. How do you uh, give a global theme? Here we have, uh, what, eight billion people living on this planet, and as we increase the complexity of living together increases, and as the complexity increases, the conflict increases, and the conflict creates people coming back into little identifications groups so that they no longer look at the global. To think globally, whether it's in the business world or the political world or the economic world or the social world, to think globally, it's got to be a tough task to have a student who may be from a more rural area of uh, Rutherford County or Coffee County or Memphis or what have you? I think it is easy to actually get students to think globally mm -hmm. uh, in this day and age. And you take a simple example. Most students come to my class in the morning, have coffee. Mm -hmm. And it is not hard to ask them, what's the ingredients in the coffee? Okay. And there's water. There's sugar, mm -hmm. there's coffee, there's a cup. Mm -hmm. And then ask them to deconstruct that and tell me where each one of them comes from. 
until they trace wow. the coffee to Colombia or South uh, Ethiopia or East Africa. Mm -hmm. Now they begin, and then I move on to look at the shirt you're wearing and look at the pro the tag at the back where that shirt is made. Mm -hmm. And they realize this shirt is made in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And now they begin to see how the world is connected. And in terms carrying of your coffee before we take a break in a moment, carrying your coffee <laughs> analogy, uh, you've got to have the coffee bean and the material for the cup and the product of sugar all coordinated in the supply chain Absolutely. so that they all show up at the same time. You know, you get the coffee, but we have no cups. <laughs> what good is having coffee without a cup unless you use the <laughs> palm of your hands and that's not going to work too well. We'll be right back. We're having a wonderful visit with Dr. Francis Kofi. I always want to be sure it's right. Kofi. Uh, Coty, Coty, I got to remember, not coffee, but Coty, uh, from uh, Middle Tennessee State University, who is bringing up a topic that probably none of us really think of, but it is so, 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 so important. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Chip Walters with Exit Realty, Bob Lamb and Associates. You might know me as the voice of the Blue Raiders, but I want to be your trusted advisor in real estate. Whether you're buying or selling, it's time to choose Chip. Do you have a growing family and need to upsize? Are you an empty nester now and need to downsize? Are you thinking of selling your current home but just worried you can't find something else? Well, it's time to choose Chip. I'm looking to be your trusted advisor in real estate. I'm Chip Walters with Exit Realty, Bob Lamb and Associates. French's Shoes and Boots is the number one place in Tennessee to find the latest Southern styles at unbelievable prices. We know you work hard for your money, so when searching for high quality footwear that won't let you down, French's has you covered. We have a huge selection of casual and work shoes and boots at the best prices in town, guaranteed. It makes good sense to shop at French's. French's Shoes and Boots. 1837 South Church Street in Murfreesboro. Fun is in full bloom, Tennessee, and the Multiplier Instant Games are buzzing in. These colorful tickets offer chances to multiply your wins 10, 20, 50, and even 100 times. It's a beautiful day for bigger and bigger prizes, and they're right for the picking right now. Find the Multiplier Instant Games today at your nearest Tennessee Lottery retailer, only from the Tennessee Lottery. Game-changing fun. Please play responsibly. This message for all the men out there. Ladies, cover your ears. If you've been feeling tired and grumpy and have noticed a lack of motivation and drive, have weight gain and loss of muscle mass, these could all be signs of low testosterone levels. And at Low T Center, they make it quick and easy to get your levels checked. It's as simple as a blood test with their on-site lab, and they'll get your results back in about 25 minutes. What I love about Low T Center is it's geared towards us, men. They know we don't like to wait around. They know we're impatient, and they know that we like things simple. For me, at times that means making things a little more simple to understand too because we're guys and we're more focused on heading home to start working on that project car in the garage who knows what you're thinking we're guys there's no telling but let me recommend low t center most health insurance is accepted for treatment there and they have the affordable and convenient treatment options that include physician monitored self-inject at home treatment for their established patients shipping treatments directly to you go to lowtcenter.com now to book your appointment online low t center reinventing men's health care this is Good Neighbor Events with Bart Walker. Brought to you by AmeriCare Pest Control and the Law Offices of John Day. This is a paid legal ad. Hi, this is John Day of the Law Offices of John Day. For more than 30 years, my team and I have worked hard to help injured people throughout Middle Tennessee. Over that time, we've helped thousands of people get the legal help they need when they've needed it the most. And if we're not able to help or aren't the right lawyer for you, we'll do the best to point you in the right direction. If you've been injured, call the law offices of John Day for a free consultation. And remember, there's no fee unless we win your case. WGNS encourages you to shop local. That helps our local economy. It's a great weekend ahead for live theater. At the Center for the Arts in Uptown Murfreesboro, Bring It On, the musical. And over at the Springhouse Theater in Smyrna, The Lion King Jr. In neighboring Woodbury, at the Art Center of Cannon County, The Crucible, all of those this weekend at our local theaters. 
Would you like to learn how to better use your computer? The Technology Engagement Center is offering free computer classes. That's a branch of our Rutherford County Library System. The Technology Engagement Center, Tech, is at 306 Minerva Drive. For information, get with the Technology Engagement Center. Now this Saturday, you can meet the author at the Lineball Library. Author Charles Bruton signs and sells his book, Muslim Mechanics. Muslim Mechanics explains Islamic beliefs, functions, and policies. Meet the author this Saturday, 10 until 2, at the Lineball Public Library. Those are WGNS Good Neighbor events. Rutherford Weather. See periods of showers and thunderstorms here this afternoon with cloudy skies high in the upper 60s. Tonight's slight chance for rain cloudy low near 47. I'm meteorologist Jennifer Wojcicki on News Radio WGNS. Currently, it's 64. Middle Tennessee Electric organizing the 23rd annual Earth Day celebration Saturday, April 20th, 10 to 2 on the square. Check out MTE's Energy Hub trailer equipped with interactive energy efficiency displays. Free fun for the whole family. Find out more at rcearthday.com. This is the Roundtable from News Radio WGNS on FM 101.9 and AM 1450 Murfreesboro, FM 100.5 Smyrna, and worldwide at WGNSRadio.com. Hello again in the second segment of the WGNS Roundtable on Thursday morning, and this is your happy host, Bill Krause, uh, having a wonderful visit with uh, Dr. Francis Cote uh, from MTSU, who brings a great, great story of the importance of the world we live in, the importance of geography and its impact on the human being. When you're taking seven students, I think you said, to yes. Africa next month, uh, I'm assuming none of them have ever been to Africa. I believe Would so. You? And what do you expect, what will you be pointing out the minute you get off? Well, first of all, I've got to ask you, how long of a plane trip is it? Or do you go directly through Europe into uh, Tez? We're going to fly into uh, London. London, okay. And then from there to Doha in Qatar. Mm -hmm. and then from Doha to uh, Arusha, Mount Kilimanjaro International Airport. In and Arusha. it'll be interesting to, are you going to kind of alert them just as the first timers? What are they going to be looking at as they land, as they arrive? What are they going to be looking at at people and geography and facilities and culture? Uh, their eyes and their ears are going to be filled. What are you going to point out to them? So the program has two, three parts. Mm -hmm. There is the part for pre-departure, where we talk about what to expect. Mm -hmm. And then there is what happens when we get on the ground, which is learning. Mm -hmm. And then there is the reflection part, when they mm -hmm. get back home, mm -hmm. to think about what just happened, what did we learn, and what does it mean? And so there are those three parts. And the pre-departure part is where I get to get the butterflies out and tell them okay. this is not, nothing scary. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be like you're visiting another city. What or do they say, what do we eat? They ask those questions. <laughs> what do we what eat? are we going to eat? Is there McDonald's Where, where there? <laughs> are we going to sleep? <laughs> yes. uh, how are we going to move from one place to another? So yeah. I prepare them and what do you uh, tell in terms them? of those. Generally, East African diet is heavily influenced by... Uh, Middle East and oh. Asian. A lot of rice. Uh, a lot of rice. Mm -hmm. Rice-based diet. And so... Little meat? That is, Little yes. Mm -hmm. Poultry? Beef or chicken. Uh, okay. That is expected. Then movement around is they move in um, the safari vehicles when you're going to uh, the Rift Valley. Mm -hmm. Then between these cities... Are the these are the open air... Uh, like jeeps? Yes, yes. Ah, you know when you say that, wasn't it about two weeks ago? One of those, was it in Kenya? Where a lion, or an elephant, an elephant attacked one of those, killed a passenger in I the... I never heard of that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Brian, do you remember that story? <laughs> Sorry about that, no. No, it was about two weeks ago, okay, the story that it was one of those that? safari vehicles. I don't know if it was Kenya, but it was on a uh, tour. <laughs> and an elephant, a bull elephant, was getting pretty angry, charged it, and uh, put his big head in there and so forth, turned the safari vehicle over, <laughs> over, and one of the, an American, one of the passengers was killed. Oh, 
anybody not know that. So we you don't try, want to tell them that story. We try to stay. <laughs> actually, I don't try to keep away information away from them. Oh, okay. I tell them all these things are things that are possible so they can be aware. And we try to steer clear from areas that are not safe. So safety is a huge part of uh, the, the experience. Besides the liability of empty issues. Absolutely. And uh, between cities, we use uh, vans. Mm -hmm. And crossing from mainland to Zanzibar Island, we use a ferry. Mm -hmm. So I make sure that they understand how So they're going to ask moving. you, when we land and we're settled, where are we going to eat the first place and what would you recommend we order? <laughs> Generally, we, we stay in course. hotels. Okay. Okay. We stay in hotels, and the me they already know the menus before we leave. Oh, okay. And in this day and age, when they have oh, uh, uh, the, little, the internet, the they toys. have already looked up each and every one of those places. And we have meetings. We started having meetings last year, mm -hmm. and in those meetings, they have an opportunity to ask me questions about what are we going to eat, what uh, where are we going to sleep. Well, let's uh, assume I'm hotels. one of those prospective students. And I'm saying, uh, what would you say we should order from the menu? What do you think would be great? Is it highly seasoned? Is it bland? Is it filling? Uh, does it have a different taste that I've never been exposed to? I'm from uh, Coffee County, Tennessee. I never had anything like that. Generally, I would recommend things they have probably tried before to start with, mm -hmm. like rice-based diet. Most people have had rice in their lives. Oh, sure. Uh, then from there, they can get the f start getting comfortable to order things which are, they are familiar with. Mm -hmm. And by the time we come back, they're not even doing the rice anymore. Do they like desserts and other desserts? Yes, they do have those, and soups especially. Oh, mainly soups. soups. What yes. would be your favorite soup? They make uh, vegetable soups. Okay. Uh, Pumpkin soups and mm -hmm. uh, tomato soup and mm -hmm. all kinds of soups. Uh, mm -hmm. What's the language spoken? The national language of Tanzania is Swahili. Okay. But the official language of business is English. It was, was that one of the British colonies along with Kenya and Zanzibar? Tanzania has a different history. Oh. Initially, German colony oh but before then, world uh, war one after world war one mm -hmm. became a uh, british protector okay because mm -hmm. kenya still carries a lot of the british influence absolutely uh even in terms of uh their political structure yes if mm -hmm. i recall right yes uh where do you stay you see i always like to make sure i have a bed that's comfortable <laughs> <laughs> Where do I stay? Before we leave, I usually I make sure that students know not to expect an American experience in Africa. So it's not a five-star <laughs> hotel. <laughs> and if it, we, it were to be the case, then there's no point. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. And so we stay in hotels most of the time. Uh, in a place where we land, the first time we land, we stay in a hotel. We, they call them apartments, but they are generally mm -hmm. a hotel. Everything is catered. But I usually give them an opportunity to experiment African food with one meal on their own. Okay. Where they go into the city and order whatever they want. They can go to a KFC if they want to because oh, it is so there. So there are franchises. There are franchises wow. there. They can go to a subway if they want be in Dar es Salaam. Is the subway different? No. Uh, because, you know, I, uh, if you go, for example, it had been last time I was in the Northeast, and you go to a McDonald's, you can order a lobster burger. It has about an ounce of lobster in it, but it's not something you'd have in uh, Murfreesboro. So you would, you could order a sandwich at a KFC. Mm -hmm. uh, it is common, but generally KFC is in Dar es Salaam. And Subway in Dar es Salaam is the same well, as Subway here. Is coffee a major morning drink? It is, but tea is the most common a little uh, bit drink of the British influence. Of the British influence. Different yes. type of tea than what you would have in London or in Nashville. It, it would be tea with milk. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. And spices, if you because of the uh, Middle Eastern and uh, Indian influence. Now, tell me, they have for dessert baklava, which is perhaps the best Middle Eastern dessert in my opinion. I'm not. I don't know whether I've had that. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. I'm not sure whether I've so had that. So when you're taking your trip in May and you're thinking of your wonderful morning here on WGNS and you're thinking. What did I take away from that morning when I'm in Tanzania? I'm going to see if they have baklava. 
<laughs> Perhaps I will that now ask be, now that I, know, now when I get to Dar es Salaam, doctor, when your... I get to Dar es Salaam in Zanzibar, I'll be asking. Now, is Zanzibar is significantly different than Tanzania, being in an island. Zanzibar Island is very Arabic, has a very strong Arabic influence, mm -hmm. and is ninety nine percent Muslim. Muslim, okay. And uh, not that it makes a big difference. No, no, in no, no. But it's a culture. It tremendous would be religious like tolerance it'd be, in Tanzania. You'd probably have more lamb, for example. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. As a major component of the, your diet. And Swahili language in Zanzibar is much spoken than when you come to mainland Tanzania, if you are in Arusha, where you might find people more comfortable in English. Is it more, in going right back to your original topic of geography, is it more influenced by its ocean location and the impact of the ocean on the economy, the impact of the ocean on life in Zanzibar versus mainland Africa? Historically, Zanzibar was part of the Sultan of Oman. It was ruled from uh, Oman. Wow. And it was part of that. And actually, much of East African coast, 16 kilometers into East Africa. Mm. And so there, that is why there's a strong connection. Wow. All right. But getting back to the introductory course. Uh, well, let's, no, let's talk about something a little bit differently. Uh, you had been recommended to be on WGNS by your soon-to-be official department chair, because you're now a consolidated department, Dr. Amy Atchison, who is a relatively newcomer to MTSU, but certainly a major, major positive impact on the entire program. Uh, when she first told me about you, she said, you've been involved with creating internships uh, for planners, is that it, in Murfreesboro or Rutherford County? My graduate school training had a strong element of planning. Mm -hmm. And so when I went to teach college, I teach a course in urban and regional planning. Mm -hmm. And when I teach students about planning, I like them to know both the theory part of planning and the practical part of planning because when they become a planner, they've got to plan. Exactly. And one of the things I've emphasized in the planning class is a practical element of planning understanding how planning works. Mm -hmm. And so part of that is they have to attend planning commission meetings at the city of Murfreesboro mm -hmm. to actually see how the city is planned in real time. And so I've had conversations with officials at the city and we this idea came up of how about if we had some of your students interning with us so they can actually get the learning part in your classroom, but they get to actually see what we do here Mm -hmm. for a, an extended period of time. And so them and I drew an extensive uh, blueprint of what that would be. And we established a permanent internship program between Great. their city and it's our program. It's a three-unit course in one semester, the internship? Well, yes. Great. What is interesting, of course, having been in city government as long as I was, planning is far more than presenting of a proposal, review of the proposal, and approval of the proposal in compliance with the zoning and related ordinances. It, to try to create, and this is so true, anyone who's interested in the planning of Murfreesboro, the planning of Rutherford County, the planning of Antioch, the planning of Laverne, uh, any community in the area, Smyrna, etc., you have to ultimately draw a balance and that's the key word in planning, a balance between what you believe as a planner is the highest and best use of the land, the highest and best quality of the land, and the realistic economic and social impact of the community that you're serving. You may want to have, uh, well, I can recall in a city that I was in, the city was very key in maximizing the use of property. And a McDonald's, applied to put a new McDonald's on a main street. And the planning commission and subsequently the city council said, we want to make this the most beautiful McDonald's anywhere of the thousands of McDonald's throughout the United States. And as a result, we want to have your building not in its normal structure layout, we want to turn it a 90 degree so we can have an extraordinary landscape plan and the creation of architectural 
I mean, really creating a castle of McDonald's. And I always remember McDonald's came back and they said, well, if we do this, we'd have to charge $12 for a hamburger. Uh, we don't think too many people are going to pay $12 for a hamburger because you're going for top quality at uh, a uh, market that's not going to pay for it. And I uh, remember we had to revise it down. So it's still there on the street. Whenever I go to California, as I'm going down the street, I remember that story with from a castle to a cave. It's the best way to describe it. Uh, you'll be in Africa two weeks, did I figure? Yes. Two weeks. And what are some of the highlights you're going to show them and they're going to experience and they're going to participate in during those two weeks? Back to the background that you just provided there about planning. Planning cities, whether it is in the United States or in other parts of the world, all the time planners are trying to improve the quality of life. Mm -hmm. And to improve the quality of life, you have to think about the actors, the different actors in producing cities. Correct. Who are driven by different motives. Mm -hmm. Many of them by the profit motive. Mm -hmm. And there has to be that balance you talked about where people we want to create employment in the city, we have given incentives to do things in the city, have to think about there are people that lo look at their houses from a use value and exchange value, not just exchange value. Mm -hmm. And so when you think in that big picture, then you bring different stakeholders to the table as a planner to facilitate the conversation to have a consensus on what kind of a city they want to live in. And it's fascinating with what you just said and this is not a criticism, it's just an observation of Nashville. And throughout much of Nashville, single family homes that have been there for years and years on lots that may be 100 feet wide and 200 feet in depth are being taken down and new planned unit developments or condominiums, 10 units for example, being built there. It's highest and best use of land it provides housing in a more affordable, all the positive things we look for, but it also produces traffic. And when you have a one house with two cars, and now you have 10 units with two cars, you've gone from two cars to 20 cars just in one piece of property. That is what creates a traffic congestion without the planning of the uh, streets and highways to handle transportation. We'll be right back for a final segment with uh, Dr. Francis Cote from MTSU, who is sharing not only some fascinating topics of which he's dealing with, but even the upcoming trip and the internships with the city of Murfreesboro. Most interesting and most, most, most informative. We'll be right back. Getting the kids to practice on time. Remembering if it's your day to bring snacks. Making it to the game with a clean jersey. Why are simple things sometimes so complicated? Thankfully, with auto owners, insurance doesn't have to be one of them. Auto owners works with independent agents who answer when you call, so you can worry about more important things, like whether your kid is going to run toward first or third base. That's simple human sense. Rayburn Insurance in Smyrna. Come see me, Rick Hall, at Rayburn Insurance in downtown Smyrna today. Online at Rayburn.net. Some people drive past Middle Point Landfill and see a mound of dirt covering yesterday's garbage, but we don't see that. At Middle Point, we see yesterday's trash as tomorrow's opportunity. We see an opportunity to convert naturally occurring gas into a low carbon alternative to fossil fuel. We're Middle Point Landfill, and we see so much more than waste. Middle Point's vision doesn't end at the start of our driveway. We're Middle Point Landfill, and we truly see a brighter future for all of us in Rutherford County. This is Kim Dunaway from Sunshine Nutrition Center. You hear me on Monday mornings at 720 talking about how to lead a healthier lifestyle. We carry supplements, personal care, and grocery items at both our Murfreesboro and Smyrna locations, family owned and operated since 1989. Spring has sprung, and that means it's time to start planning for your summer road trips. With Bud's Tire Pros by your side, your vehicle will be ready to see the mountains, the beaches, and everything in between. With Bud's Tire Pro's full line of Michelin tires and products, you'll have the peace of mind to hit the road no matter what you drive. Bud's Tire Pro's is only 3.5 miles from the Murfreesboro Square. Call Bud's Tire Pro's at 896-TIRE or online. Bud's Tire Pro's, TN.com. Fellow Americans. 
Former CIA officer Jason Hansen here. Market instability and soaring debt have put your retirement at risk. For protection, I recommend diversifying into physical gold from Advantage Gold, a five-star rated gold company I've used for years. Their customer service is unmatched. Call 800-741-GOLD now and say Jason Hansen sent you and get a free 2024 gold investing kit. Again, call 800-741-GOLD. In retirement, it's all about income, your money, making money, and you're not spending down your principal. That's the way we do it at Retirement Income Solutions. So if you're spending down your principal or your money's not making money, keeping you ahead of inflation, check us out today at risolutions.net, risolutions.net. And make sure to join us Saturdays at noon and Sunday afternoons at 1 for Retirement Income Solutions Radio with Nathan Cox and Lindsay Cotter. The Garden Patch Thrift Shop on Spring Street in downtown Murfreesboro. We are very blessed to have volunteers, to have friends that are decorators that come in and merchandise our store and do our window displays that help with linens, that help with jewelry, that help just make the store look really nice. Proceeds from sales benefit Greenhouse Ministries, a faith-based nonprofit serving the underserved here in Murfreesboro. The Garden Patch Thrift Shop on Spring Street, across from the tall NHC building. This is the Roundtable from News Radio WGNS on FM 101.9 and AM 1450 Murfreesboro, FM 100.5 Smyrna, and worldwide at WGNSRadio.com. This is Bill Krause in the final segment of the WGNS Roundtable on your delightful, thrilling Thursday mornings. And we are having a wonderful visit with Dr. Francis Cote, who is from MTSU, teaches geography, human geography, and all the related factors. Uh, in meeting you, you're a highly motivating young man, highly motivating. I've got to say Thank that. You. And it, I always say this to our educators who we visit with, how are you motivating the young men and young women who are in your program? I would certainly say because you are somewhat of a specialized program rather than a general ed program, uh, that they have a specific reason to enroll in your class because it's part of a plan that they're pursuing for their professional and non-professional lives, as the case may be. How do you motivate uh, Rutherford counties and related counties, uh, young men and young women, as they come into the classroom and you're providing and presenting information but how do you get them excited about the information? Because, you know, we've just touched on this topic and just touched on the surface. And there's got to be some enthusiasm, excitement that can be generated. When we receive students at the beginning of their freshman year, they are at mm -hmm. different levels of sure. confidence. There are students who have come from environments where they don't have opportunities to express themselves. Mm -hmm. There are students who come with the opportunity, who have had the opportunities to express themselves, but they don't, they, they don't have the, they don't have the background to ask the right questions mm -hmm. like we talked about earlier. And they don't form logical uh, they don't think critically. They haven't gotten those uh, skills to think critically. And to get them motivated is to get them involved mm -hmm. in ways that they are comfortable doing it and grow their interest in a subject, say, with things like doing internships, mm -hmm. things like going abroad, things like participating in activities within the department. Mm -hmm. And that way they begin to see themselves as part of the program. That way they are motivated right. to do things. And, uh, it's, and because you're dealing with a subject that certainly is not common conversation among young men and young women or adults returning back to school, veterans returning back to school. It's not, a, you know, you hear geography. My first reaction, <laughs> really good, I hope this isn't a hurting comment. My first reaction is, oh, I remember geography in the second and third grade and we had huge maps on the wall in school and we learned where each of the seven continents were and we learned you know the bridges between continents so it was basically a physical journey to know north of america south america i didn't even remember in a class asking the question which continent is central america in you know is it north america or south america and the teacher looked at me and she said below the mexican border it's become south america 
uh, I don't know if I'm right, if I remember that or no, <laughs> and so forth. So it was basically just a class we had to take geography and learn, quote, the physical layout of the world. But you're going into topics that have such extreme importance on today and tomorrow's world, uh, and to introduce them to that so that they suddenly realize that they're in a journey that uh, is unlimited. It's a journey even better than Disney World. Absolutely. And students that come to my, to my classes, the very first day, they learn that they will not just be obtaining or receiving information from me. They mm -hmm. will be contributing to what is happening in the classroom. And how I make that happen, I going back to your question of motivating students, I create activities that get them to think mm -hmm. about what we are doing. They get them to write about what they, they are, we are doing. They get them to talk about what they are doing. And say, for example, when I have them watch a short video mm -hmm. about the city of Dubai, mm -hmm. I ask them some very basic questions anybody can answer. Mm -hmm. What did you, two thi tell me two things you found fascinating. Mm -hmm. And they are quick to tell so me about the people. Will you be going into Dubai? We actually sometimes go okay, through Dubai. Why I say that is... Uh, I used to teach uh, ho uh, hospitality and tourist industry in, when I was in Southern California. And I didn't realize that Dubai is the, has the only six-star hotel in the world. Not a five-star, but a six-star. And it would be worthy to take a visit to the, be in the lobby of a six-star hotel. <laughs> I'm a people watcher. I would love to see who are the people paying $25,000 a night for the penthouse uh, in uh, that hotel in Dubai. I, I'm sure you're not staying in a $25,000 no, room. No, we do not usually have a budget to stay in those places. Will you places. do me a huge favor? And I'm going to ask this, this put you on the spot. If you find of your seven students, two of them that really, and I don't want to have you making choices, but two who really would be delighted to share their first and lasting impressions of this trip that you're just going ahead, would you be at all open to the idea of inviting the two and the four of us will have a conversation about the visit? I'll be more than happy. It be? is not required as oh, no, part no, no, of class. Oh, no, 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 absolutely not. But I could ask them, and I think that would be, anybody... be great. See, I love to have people do their podcast on WGNS because it becomes a record of an activity. And if somebody is uh, putting a resume together, graduating uh, undergraduate, graduate student, MTSU, on the resume is uh, made a presentation on WGNS. I think it'll be a fantastic so idea. So let me know. I mean, I, I, I don't know how our men and women in the audience feel, but I would love to hear firsthand impressions of young Rutherford and related county uh, people talking about a place that 99% of us have never been to. Absolutely. I think that would be a great idea. And then you get to ask the students, how does he motivate you to like well, this Well, I thing? don't know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if suddenly you had recommended a uh, item on a menu and that young man or young woman ate that item, they said, where, doctor, 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 I really need a doctor. That food, that food, <laughs> it's spicy, it's hot. Ah, I've never tasted anything like that. Oh, I've just rated this trip as a yes. F a trip, you know, rather than an A trip. Uh, I think that'd be really neat. I, I would love would, to do that. And I, and, you know, and I'm not saying they have to more likely be residents of uh, our listening area of Rutherford County and surrounding counties, but if they happen to be, they would be very, very good. Uh, in a final series of comments, if there were five things you wanted me to know, I'm not even talking about the radio audience or your students, about what you would want me to know as a result of your degrees, your education, your academic pursuits, what would five things about your topic be most important for me to know if I didn't know anything, which happens huh. often? That is a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you, uh, from a professional standpoint, not sure. family. Family, obviously, is knowing my family. Mm -hmm. uh, but from a professional standpoint is what I teach, mm -hmm. uh, the courses I teach, and what my research is, which is studying communities and cities and area of focus is mm -hmm. Africa, where I do research. And 
the things I do outside of teaching and research. Are you currently on a particular research project now? I just completed a research project where we were looking at the level of engagement of studying COVID-19 in African cities wow. using special data science. Wow. And initially, I was looking at the performance of the urban informal sector at the time when every cities were shut down yes. in East Africa. Mm -hmm. Then after that, we were looking at what was being studied in real time when COVID-19 was happening. And one paper is published in a book chapter and the other one is published in a journal. Oh, we're, we're going to have to have you back just on that topic. <laughs> Comparative to American cities, uh, quite different, some commonality. One of the things which I was looking at specifically was how was some of these places which don't have the infrastructure mm -hmm. for such an emergency, how did they become resilient? And mm -hmm. uh, Did they all have uh, the ability to Zoom and communicate from uh, home, isolated environments? We are actually talking about people that operate outside of the formal Ooh, economy okay. uh, who sell things in the street and mm -hmm. uh, for some reason they were quite resilient and as soon as COVID-19 was over the whole thing just sprang back up except with a lot of new actors people that had lost employment in formal sector okay. coming back as part of the informal sector. Wow so that would be a fascinating area for us to talk about because, you know, we're still living under the effects of uh, COVID-19, and we will mm -hmm. for, I have to say, at least a generation mm -hmm. in education, if nothing else. And you asked me about the five things. I think mm -hmm. two more things that I'll probably add that you would know about myself is the service part of my employment. Okay. Where I represent my department in the faculty senate, mm -hmm. and I also double up as uh the chapter sponsor of the Gamma Theta Upsilon, which is the International Honor Society for the Discipline of Geography. Wow. And we actually have an induction next week uh, coming up. And I'm also the faculty advisor for African Students Organization on campus. Wow. And that in its... Well, you know, we just touched the surface. It would be interesting <laughs> how you would be advising <laughs> students that are coming into a new culture called American culture. And primarily, and when we say Africa, we can't generalize. Eastern Absolutely. would be a lot different than Western or Southern or Northern and so forth. It has been a wonderful opportunity and pleasure uh, to have uh, with us this morning, this beautiful Thursday morning, uh, Dr. Francis Cotu, Coti, yes. Coti, uh, who is at MTSU, part of an expanded uh, consolidation of the political science and the geography world of uh, the school. A gentleman that has got to be a great inspiration to his students and uh, one who would be very enjoyable to take a trip with Af to Africa with. Absolutely. If you ever look for outside people, that might be on my bucket list. Yeah, you can. Keep up the great work. Thank you for coming. We'll see you all next week. Thank you. Oh.